We're continuing in our series, Our Hope Endures. When you show a video like this, you can predict with a group this size that there's probably three or four differing reactions. Uh, frankly, there's probably some of us in here that uh, it just didn't really mean a whole lot. Uh, it could be for any number of reasons. We might have been distracted. We may be tired. We may be hungry. We may be going through something in life that uh, this just didn't connect. There's others of us, we're sympathetic with what the video showed. I mean, it means something to us that God demonstrated his love to us in Christ's sacrifice, even while we were still sinners in rebellion. It really means something to us, but if we were to be completely honest, we're so familiar with that message that, that although the video was cool and it was interesting, it, it probably didn't very deeply touch us emotionally. Uh, there's some of us that... Probably it went right straight to the center of our hearts and we're feeling very full, very uh, emotional, very sensitized to God's grace and God's love. The interesting thing about this and this whole phenomenon is, is that here we are, we are creatures that whether we like it or not, we are absolutely love driven from the moment we are born until we die. We are absolutely on the search for love. We try to get as much of it as we can. We try to get it any way that we can. And as I was preparing for this message, uh, an image came to my mind, and it's nothing profound. But it was just an image that I pictured like, you know, a bunch of farmland. And we see this frequently here in, in the summer times. I hope it doesn't happen for farm folk here this summer. But it just, it gets dry. We have drought, and everything starts to dry up, and the corn doesn't grow, and nothing is growing the ground is hard and it's cracked and it's barren. And I saw, you know, like all this dried land, all these dry farm fields. And then even some people, people that were staggering around literally on the edge of dying of thirst and seeking out little bits of water that was in a mud puddle here and there. And then right in the midst of all this, this gigantic, beautiful reservoir. Uh, a reservoir full of crystal clear, pure water. The water was more than enough to flood all of the fields and produce all kinds of good vegetation, more than enough to satisfy the thirst of everyone that was staggering around, grabbing at what little bit of water uh, polluted at that was available. And yet, it was not getting into these areas that so desperately needed it. You know, the, the floodgates were open, they were accessible, they were available, but, excuse me, they weren't open, that was the problem, but they were available and accessible, but, but not open. And so the land was dying, and souls were on the edge of death. And when I look at that picture, I think that that is so frequently true of the way that, that even we who would qualify ourselves in here as those that have put our faith and trust in Christ and, and are his followers, that, that we kind of live that way too. If we were honest, at times our souls feel a little dry, they feel a little empty, there's not a lot of life in us, there's not much energy that produces spiritual fruit, those Christ-like qualities. You know, when a person is dying of thirst... Uh, almost all your capacities diminish, right? You can't think properly. You can't function physically properly. Uh, you can't do much for anybody else. When you have water in your body, sufficient levels of water, you can think, your capacities work, and, and you can do all kinds of things. Well, spiritually, that is true as well. Uh, the problem is, is we live in a society that, that so pushes us to live physically to be doing and thinking and doing and thinking and get in a routine and add more and more to our routine, that spirituality, living from something of our inner being, is pretty much discouraged in our society. And it becomes more and more foreign to us. It's just a heck of a lot easier, you know and I know it, to just stay busy, you know, kind of do the right things and stay busy. But when we do that, this, this water, this reservoir of the love of God can't really flood into our souls either, even though we may be sympathetic, even though we may be followers of Christ. And consequently, everything about the Christian life becomes more of a lot of do's and don'ts. There's no, there's no energy, there's no spontaneity, there, there's no flow. And so it's a real perplexing thing when you think about it. Here we are, we are these love-starved beings. Every human being you will ever meet, doesn't matter where you're at in the world, any time in history, we are always seeking love. Listen. We think about it, we write about it, we dream about it, we pray for it, some even try to pay for it, we lie, cheat, steal, and even kill for it, we write songs about it, we write poetry about it, we write books about it, we put TV and movie together about it, we eat it, we drink it, we sleep it, if it's ever taken away from us, it rips our hearts apart, 
If we feel like it's fading, we can hardly live and breathe. And when we get even the slightest fragment of it, even in sometimes the most dysfunctional, brutal, abusive circumstances, irrationally, some of us will cling to it because we are so desperate for this thing called love. Every human being, as long as we live and we breathe, we are hungry and thirsting for love. And it's no mystery as to why. I mean, if you, if you think that we all just got here by accident, it is a bit mysterious. But if you look at what Scripture says, the Scripture says that God, a living God, an eternal, omnipotent God, who is defined himself as love incarnate, he created us in his image. 1 John 4, 8, it says, God is love. And we are made in his image. Therefore, as long as we're alive, we're going to be love-driven beings. Now, what's love got to do with it? It's got everything to do with it. A man can have, a woman can have everything else in life. You know this and I know this. But if this longing, this, this hunger and thirst we have for love, if it is not satisfied, then nothing else much matters. And let me go a step further. If, if we are in that condition where we're dry and parched and we're not having our souls filled with love, God's love, we tend to be extremely vulnerable to human love and we tend to make a lot of mistakes and we all know the song, Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places and many of us have some history in looking for love in those wrong places and we become very vulnerable and very needy and consequently also very demanding because we are looking for a human, an imperfect, fragmented, needy human to meet our love needs. Can't happen can't happen. There is not a human or group of humans alive that can meet the longing for love that you and I have in our souls because it was never meant to be that way. As precious and important and as valuable as human love is, there is a love that we hunger for. It is a perfect love. It is an unfailing love. And it is a love that can only be had from God himself. And, and in this image that was in my mind, here's the floodgates of God's love. It said in that verse on the video, it says that, that even when we were still in sin, God loved us and sent his son to die for us. But why? What, what, what disconnects? Why don't we frequently, why don't we regularly, why don't we feel that love? Why, why isn't that fullness, that reservoir of God's love flooding into our souls, flowing in us all the time so that we walk through life feeling full of his love? And you know and I know that that's, that's not typical. Even for we that are fully devoted followers of Christ and have followed him for many years. Where's the problem? If this love is so available, and it absolutely is. And, and, and I want to I explain something to you. I'm not saying love like up here, you know, like God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I want to tell you, that is very important. I stake my life on that verse. But that's knowing that God loves me. You know, he kind of loves me in a global fashion, me and everybody else. And that's important. Don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about that today, though. I'm talking about feeling, feeling the love of God in my soul, in your soul, as a, as a powerful force. Listen, you know what it feels like when you feel somebody loves you or when you feel love for them. It's, it's intoxicating. It's addicting. The feeling of love we all know. I'm talking about feeling, feeling in a tangible way, in a transforming way, the love of God as a daily reality. And the floodgates just need to be open. The reservoir is there. God wants to pour out, flood our souls with his love. But even we that love Christ and are devoted to him, if we're honest, we have trouble getting this resource that God so wants to give into our souls. And let me tell you, it's health bringing. It brings new capacities to life. It gives us strength. It gives us power. It gives us clarity. It gives us stability. We are not so vulnerable, and yet we are very generous at the same time in the way we treat others. It, it just does all the right things. But but what's the problem? How do, we, how do we open the floodgates? How do we get this in? How do we keep it flowing into us? That's what I want to spend the rest of the time in this message, um, hopefully sharing with you. And I, I'm going to tell you, this is one of these messages that kind of snuck up on me, busy week, you know, and a bit fragmented. And then when I really had to sit down and focus on it, I realized, oh, great. Um, this is one of these that, that gets very close to me and, and wrecks me. I was... Um, not in the greatest shape in the first service. I'm going to do my best to stay a little bit better composed. But, um, you know, 
everybody has something that's real personal, and, and this one's real personal to me. So our longing for love, and I do want to say something. I am not trying to diminish human love, if anybody gets that impression, but what I am saying is when we are full of God's love, we can give love and receive love in a much healthier, much more enjoyable, uh, much more effective fashion. So I'm not diminishing the importance of human love. Please don't, don't misunderstand that. I'm just saying there that we're complex beings and we need God's love and we need human love, both giving and taking. All right. To open these floodgates, to, to have our souls filled, we need to do basically three things. And they're, they're not profound. They're simple. Unfortunately, they are difficult to um, apply on a regular basis. And, and that's why we tend to have what I would call leakage. Sometimes we're full of God's love and it kind of leaks out. And we lose the feeling, the sense of it. So the first thing is this. Um, Proverbs 19, 22, it just kind of describes us. It says, what a man desires is what? Unfailing love. I'm going to tell you something. A lot of people chase uh, success and possessions and experiences and adrenaline rushes and prestige and power and popular, all kinds of things. And what they're really looking for is unfailing love. It says, what a man desires is unfailing love. And unfailing love is a hard thing to find. Unfailing love only exists for now, for now, in God. It will exist in every human and every angel forever. But for now, it exists in its perfect form in God. And we can only be satisfied when we are really feasting or drinking in this love. And the first thing that it calls for doing is we just simply have to trust in it. I mean, that sounds simple and trite, I know. But let me take you deeper. I mean, to really trust in and rely on the fact that God, in a singular, intimate way, knows you, knows me, knows everything about us, knows our strengths, our weaknesses, our tendencies to ignore him, and so on, and even to break his, his laws and break his heart. He knows us, and he loves us. And there's nothing you can ever do to stop him from loving you. Now, that doesn't mean that you and I can't reject his love. We most certainly can. And he will allow us to do that. You know, I mean, the sun can be shining like it is on a beautiful day like today, but I could just hover in my basement in darkness, but the sun's still shining, right? I can block it out, but it's still there. This God really, truly, by name, knows you, really knows you, everything about you that no one else knows, can know, would be able to bear, and loves you. He's unshockable in his love toward you and I. He is unstoppable in his love toward you and I. And I'm telling you, you can, you can put this up here, but when it gets down here, that has power. That has transforming power. One of my favorite writers on this subject that I always go back to again and again, I just don't, I read a lot. I've read a lot through my Christian life and I continue, I'm always reading. I've never read any writer that can quite capture the ability to communicate the love of God the way one writer does, a guy named Brennan Manning. And I just want to read you something. I, I think I've actually probably shared this with you before, but bear with me again. That he says in one of his books called uh, Relentless Trust. Manning says, though we often disregard our need for an unfaltering trust in the love of God, that need is the most urgent we have. It is the remedy for much of our sickness and melancholy and self-hatred. The heart converted from mistrust to trust in the irreversible forgiveness of Jesus Christ is redeemed from the corrosive power of fear. Let me read you something a little further along that he says. He says, wallowing in shame and remorse, self-hatred and guilt, over real or imagined failings in our past lives betrays a distrust in the love of God. It shows that we have not accepted the acceptance of Jesus Christ and thus have rejected the total sufficiency of His redeeming work. Preoccupation with our past sins, present weaknesses, and character defects gets our emotions churning in self-destructive ways. And it closes us within the mighty citadel of self and it preempts the presence of the compassion of God. I mean, to Manning, the source of all true spiritual growth, the source of all true spiritual healing, it starts as we learn how to open these floodgates and let God's love become a powerful reality, not just in our head, but down to the level where we are feeling His love on a regular basis. 
Manning tells a story that I've shared before about a priest named uh, Edmund Farrell, a Detroit priest. And Farrell wanted to go back to Ireland to celebrate his uncle Seamus's uh, 80th birthday. And so he went back to Killarney and he prepared for the big day with his uncle Seamus. And so they got up before sunrise and they went up to Lake Killarney and they just wanted to share the sunrise together. And so they stood there and the sun started coming up. It was a beautiful day over the lake. And Pharaoh looked over at his aged uncle, 80 years old, and he saw him just smiling, and the smile got bigger and bigger and bigger. And all of a sudden, as the sun came up, Uncle Seamus just started skipping like a little kid. 80 years old, he's skipping. And so Pharaoh caught up with him. He says, Uncle Seamus, you look, you look really happy today. And he says, oh, boy, I am really happy today. He says, my Abba, he used the term that Jesus did, my, my Papa, my Father, my Daddy, my Abba, he said, is very fond of me, meaning God. Now, that sounds like a simple statement. But, but there's a difference between knowing in sort of a global general sense, God loves me, well, he loves everybody, and God's fond of me. Uh, God enjoys me. God delights in me. I'm imperfect. I'm a mess. I'm up. I'm down. I'm everything in between. But I know that God not just loves me, he's fond of me. He likes me. It's a very different question to ask yourself sometime. You might say, well, do you believe God loves you? Most of us would say yes. But do you believe God likes you? Do you believe he really looks and he smiles and he enjoys you? You say, but Randy, I, you know, I feel that when I'm really being faithful and obedient. But, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm displeasing him. Yeah, but... Do you have that sense that he's just fond of you? He just loves you. He just enjoys you. That's a, that's a whole deeper level. That's a whole different thing. And that's what I'm talking about when I say a kind of a trust in the love of God, a kind of reliance on it that opens these floodgates. Listen to the way the psalmist expressed it in Psalm 52.8. He said, but I am like an olive tree flourishing in the house of God. I trust in God's, what does it say? Unfailing love. His love fails not. Unfailing love forever and ever. The psalmist is saying, you know, I'm just kind of growing all the time. And every season of life doesn't matter. And this was written by David who went through lots of hard times. He says, whatever the season of life, it doesn't matter. Because the reservoir, the flood of God's love comes into me. And I start to develop in any kind of circumstance. New capacities, new abilities. To love, to give, to serve, to share. To enjoy life in the difficult times as well as the easy times. He said, man, I'm like an olive tree that just grows and grows in any kind of circumstance. Psalm 32, 10, the psalmist David again said this. He said, the Lord's, what? Unfailing love surrounds the man or the woman that trusts in him. Do you trust in God? Have you made a decision that you're going to trust in Jesus Christ and follow him fully? You say, well, but Randy, I, I don't quite feel that I'm, I'm at that point. I've got to get some things straightened out in my life. I'm not quite, I'm not quite good enough for that yet. You know, I, I don't want to do it until I can do it really right. You'll never do it. If, if you wait until you can do it right, if you wait until you have it all cleaned up and tidied up, you'll never do it. We come to Christ just as we are. And he loves us and he accepts us and he receives us just as we are. But he loves us so much he doesn't leave us as we are. He helps us to become who we were meant to be. He helps us to change. He helps us to grow. He helps us to put off sin and self-directed living and self-destructed living and to put on righteousness. It's a process. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He's not shocked by our failures and our drifting. But his love is active and it starts a change process when we rely on it. It says in 1 John 4, 16, it says, And so we know and rely, we trust in it, we rely on it, we count on it. The love of God has for us, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. Listen, God wants us to access the reservoir of his love and the way we do it is we start really relying on it every day of our life any season of our life no what's going no matter what's going on or not now let me probe this a bit with some of you could you wake up tomorrow if everything started going south in your life you know your 
your career, your job, your economic circumstances started tanking, started going south, if your health started going south, if the relationships that mean so much to you started fragmenting, they started diminishing or altogether leaving your life. I mean, if life really turned dark and bad for you tomorrow, would you interpret that as an indicator that God's not caring for you, that he doesn't love you? Or would you be so confident on his unfailing love that you say, let the earth quake, let the mountains be removed, let people do what they want, let life do what it wants? I know, I know you love me. You have eternally proven that by your sacrifice on the cross for my sins. And my circumstances are no indicator of your love. I will not be moved. My hope will endure. I'm going to rely on your love. It's unfailing. You'll never leave me. You'll never forsake me. Do you have that kind of trust? Because that's the kind of trust that opens these, these valves and starts to let in this flood of God's love. Listen. If you blow it big time this week, if you sin shamefully in some measure this week, if you really go down the hill this week, are you still going to have the sense that God loves you just as much? I didn't say he's going to be pleased with what you and I do at that time, but are you going to have the sense that he loves you just as much? You need to have that sense because that opens these floodgates, and the sooner you let his love in, the sooner your heart will be melted the sooner you will stop living self-destructively and come to your senses and let him love you. I'm going to just be honest with you. Um, one of my biggest problems uh, after all these years of being a Christian, um, just something broken in me, I don't know. Um, it, it's just, stupid as this sounds, just uh, letting God love me. I mean, I've said before, I'm very comfortable serving God. I'm very comfortable being, you know, on the front lines for God. I am, I'm very awkward and just being me and feeling um, that God would enjoy me and that he would love me, just me, just nothing else. And so maybe you're like that. And the Spirit of God is here saying, you know what, just let yourself be loved. Let yourself be loved in your weakness, in your brokenness, in your imperfection. Don't let circumstances confuse you. This is unfailing eternally proven love let it in live in it delight in it delight in it especially in your weak moments and your broken moments and don't forget it in your strong moments because it's the life-giving water Jesus said a lot of times that he was the water of life his love brings life to our spirits and souls and then we start to become fully human and fully alive so we have to trust in it to open these floodgates so that we start to feel it, get it out of our head and get it into our emotional life. And your emotions and mind count. That's part of who we are in the image of God. Now the second step we need to take, and I really believe this is the missing link. I think this is the most important one because it's the one that we understand the least, practice the least, and probably will find the most confusing. We need to meditate on it. And meditate doesn't mean, you know, this weird posture with your hands up making humming noises. You know, biblical meditation is you, you focus your mind on truth, God's truth, and on God. And you think about something and you turn it over and over in your mind. And you let your imagination, your God-enlightened reason and imagination expand it. You let the Spirit of God uh, show you a little more about it and a little more about it and a little more. And you take some time and you still your soul. Listen to what the psalmist said in Psalm 48.9. He said, within your temple, O God, we meditate on your what? I'm convinced this is where we have our breakdown. We're, we're just, we're living such a busy society. It, it's such a sensory, saturated society. I, I'm not going to pick on you or anything, but, but tell the truth. How many of you, the first thing you do when you get in your car is you turn something on? Radio, CD, something. Let me see your hands. Some of you even turn the TV on, and you shouldn't do that. <laughs> I see you watching TV, fixing your eye makeup, and all, you know. Of course, that was sexist to say, but, but guys do terrible things too. We drink and eat and mix things, and who knows what we do. But, uh, you know, this is just, we, we didn't pick this time to be alive, but we live in a society that bombards our senses 24-7. Everything is faster and faster and faster. We're busy, we're regimented, we're, we're on the run. And it is, it is very, very difficult for we alive today to, to get into a spiritual frame of mind, to just slow ourselves down 
to focus. Even when we read scripture and pray, we, we tend to do it rather, you know, in a hurry or routinely. Okay, I got to get my 15 minutes in or my half hour, you know, and I'm doing my devotions. As opposed to just stopping. I, I, I'm pleading with some of you. I, I, I know how difficult this might be. Find a way, find a way if you can to get a little bit of time every day, half hour, hour, and just sit and let God love you. And just sit and meditate, it said, on his unfailing love. That means think about how much he loves you. How he's always got his mind on you. How he's cared for you in the past and is caring for you now and will care for you in the future. I want to show you, but I want to give you a little example how you do this. I want to show you. Turn, if you would, to page um, 618. And this Bible is near you on the chair or Psalm 139. I just want to give you a little sample. I want to show you, because I know we're not used to this kind of thing. I want to show you how you meditate on God's unfailing love. This is not the only way. This is just an example. You should be looking at Psalm 139. And I'm just going to kind of read you some scattered verses, but, but you'll get the sense of what I'm doing. And, and again, this is only useful if you... Put this into practice, but I'm going to really show you how. All right, Psalm 139, this is David again, who, who was a great uh, God lover and one that knew how to spend time with God. He said, O oh Lord, you have searched me, and you what? You know me. You know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. See, David, David's doing this. He's thinking in the presence of God. He's meditating, and, and the Spirit's kind of taking him on. He says, you really know me, Lord. You know when I sit, and you know when I rise. You perceive my what? My thoughts. You know my thoughts, God, from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with what? All my ways. All my ways. You know it completely before a word is on my tongue you know it completely now David's already doing this he's already meditating on on God and God's love but now I want to show you how to do this more specifically let's look at this same passage we just read but after each sentence you're, you're going to say this and yet you love me and yet you love me watch how it works oh Lord you have searched me and you know me, you really, you know the whole me, and yet you love me. You get alone in God's presence, you trust me on this one. You get alone, you spend some time, you calm your soul, and you say, oh God, you know me. You, you know the things I think about, you know the things I've thought about, you know my imaginations, and you know the things I'm embarrassed about, and you know what I've done, and you know what I dream about, and, and yet you, you still love me. You love things that no one else could bear. You see, and yet you love me. Then you'd read on. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways, and yet you love me. You know my bad habits. You know my weaknesses. You know, and yet you love me. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely. You know everything I'm going to say. And I might say idiotic things in the course of any given day. And yet you love me. Oh, man, your love is unstoppable. Your love is unshockable. You get alone with God. You spend time. And this starts to saturate your soul until you feel it. And until you feel it, it has not accomplished. Sometimes we as Christians, we diminish the importance of emotions. Do not do so. This really matters. Brennan Manning, the same author that I was telling you about, he tells a story. And this is just kind of a parabolic story. It was not a true story. But in the story, this very harried, busy, stressed out business executive decides he's got to get away from it all for a while and he needs to find out what's going wrong inside of him and so he goes far away to this this desert retreat where this hermit this mystic this this god lover just spends time in his cave and seeks god and seeks to coach others on how to connect with god and he goes to this hermit and he starts gushing out all of his stress and all of his panic and all of his frustration with life and the the monk just kind of quiets him and walks back into the cave. He comes back out. He sets down a bowl on the ground. And he has a pitcher of water in his hand. And he starts pouring water. And he says to the man, he says, Look into the water until you can find your face, your countenance in the water. And he's pouring the water from up high into the bowl. And of course, it's splashing around. It's turbulent. It's moving. And the man cannot see his countenance in the turbulent water. 
And the monk says, just, just be patient. Keep looking, keep looking. And he finally stops pouring. And the water's still jostling. It's moving. You know how it is. It takes a time. But after a time that seemed like eternity to the stressed out executive, it finally slowed and it finally stopped. And when it stopped, he could see his face in the water. And Manning says this. He says, our lives are so harried and so stressed and so busy. Unless we stop and linger quietly in the presence of God on a regular basis, we cannot see our real identity. And our real identity is the beloved, the cherished son or daughter of God. And we walk through life like orphans. We walk through life like those that, that have no loving father. We walk through life lonely and scared and vulnerable. Because we don't know we're the beloved. We're the beloved, the cherished of God. You've got to learn. You've got to learn to read scripture differently. Let, let me share another verse that's right on your outline here. 1 John 4.10. I'll show you how to apply the same thing. It says in 1 John 4.10, This is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us. You could take that same process. You could say, oh God. Oh, God, you love me when I don't care about you. You love me in the days when I lived as your enemy, when I used your name as a curse word, when I broke all your laws and I didn't care about you. You love me. You must remember that in God's presence. And you keep saying, and yet you love me. You love me when I don't care about you, when I drift. You still love me. You let that sink into your heart. And it does a transforming work. I want to show you something really cool. Turn to page 1067 in those Bibles that are... Uh, near you and they're already open and, and for the rest of you it's the Gospel of John chapter 13 the Gospel of John is really kind of unique in a number of ways but the Apostle John is the writer of the Gospel but he never ever identifies himself as the writer in the entire Gospel and it is the most spectacular I mean it it takes you to a place that the other Gospels don't take you. I mean, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, I'm, I'm not trying to say that one Scripture is more inspired than another. I'm just trying to say John saw something in the heart of Jesus that the other guys did not, and God used that. But, but I want to show you something really cool about John. Look at John chapter 13, verse 23. One of them, the disciple, what does it say? Whom Jesus loved was reclining next to him, meaning next to Jesus. John is describing himself. Now, now I want to ask you a question. Did Jesus love all of his disciples? Yes. But John is the only one that had this wonderful audacity to identify himself like this. I'm the disciple that Jesus loves. He had looked deeper into the eyes and heart of Jesus than the rest. I'm the disciple. I'm the disciple that Jesus loved. He loved them all. But John had the audacity to say it and to believe it and to feel it. L listen, listen how he does this. Go, go, if you would, to chapter 19, verse 26. It's, it's very, very interesting. In chapter 19, verse 26. Now Jesus is on the cross, and from the cross he is speaking. And he says in verse 26, When Jesus saw his mother there, she's at the foot of the cross, Mary is, and the disciple, what? Whom he loved. Now, did he love all the disciples? Yes, but, but Jesus knew that John had the audacity to just say it. And Jesus delighted in it. Listen, God really wants to open the floodgates. He really has a hard time getting you and I to believe. We're the disciple that he loves. And just that in all of our imperfection. Look, if, if you would, in chapter 21, verse 7. Same gospel. This is after Jesus had risen from the dead. It says, then the disciple whom Jesus loved. He's, John's talking about himself. Said to Peter, you know, it is the Lord. Look again in the same chapter, verse 20, uh, actually verse 20, I believe it is. Let me make sure that I'm doing, yes, verse 20. 
Peter turned and saw what the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. Even Peter knew it, the other disciples. It's interesting. They never try to rag on him. Like, who do you think you are? Do you think you're better than the rest of us? They probably all wanted to say it, but didn't quite have the courage. I, I suggest none of them felt worthy, and, and it's impossible to feel worthy. None of us are worthy. It's not about your worthiness. It is about this outrageous, unstoppable, unshockable love of God, and he wants us, he wants us to just believe the unbelievable. I mean, we're the disciple that Jesus loves. We're the disciple that Jesus loves when we're running away from him and failing him. They did. And we're the disciple that Jesus loves when we're standing courageous as a lion at the foot of the cross saying, Lord, if you want me to take care of your mother, I'll take care of her or your work or your people or the people you've entrusted to me. We've got to let this sink in. Meditate. We need to trust in his love. We need to meditate on his love. And then there's a third part. We need to hope in his love. We need to know that this is a love that no matter what occurs in this crazy mixed up world of ours or this crazy unpredictable life of ours, I can always hope in it. I can always count on it. It is my present. It is my future. And it will be a grand future beyond anything that I can experience now. There's a day coming when all the universe will be full of God's love. Every human, every angel, I will be totally immersed in it all the time, 24-7. I'll never feel lonely i'll never feel detached i'll never feel different i'll never feel guilt shame fear rejection every day of your life and my life i will be full of this love god's for me and it will be flowing out of me for everyone else and it'll be flowing back to me from everyone else that's my hope it is an enduring hope because Christ rose from the dead and he proved that love is superior to hate, that it triumphs, it's omnipotent, and he promises that just as he rose from the grave, he will bring an everlasting community, an everlasting world of perfect love. And you want that, and I want that, and it's a trustworthy hope. We must never let go of the, the hope of the Father's eternal, everlasting love. It was an interesting case that came to light, um, I think it was just this past year actually, there was a young girl and um, she lived in Keeves, Keevesport, I don't know where Joan is, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right this time, first service she said I did, but in Keevesport, Pennsylvania, and um, it's a strange and an ugly and, a, and a, a horrible story frankly, as a young teenage girl, uh, 14 years old in middle school, she was having some difficulties at home, you know, as teenagers will, but there was a uh, building guard at this particular middle school that struck up a friendship with her. He was 38 years old. She was 14. He deepened the friendship with her and took it to the place where he convinced her that uh, her parents didn't really love her, didn't really care about her, that nobody, in fact, really loved her or understood her or cared for her the way he, this building guard, did. And this child ran away from home, and she moved in with this building guard just a few miles from her actual house, of her parents' house. This 38-year-old man took this 14-year-old girl into his house. He lived with his elderly parents. He moved her into his bedroom without his parents even knowing it. I know this sounds bizarre, but it it's came to light. It was a news article. You probably even saw it on CNN. For four years, from age 14 to 18, this kid lived in his bedroom and never went out of the house. His parents never knew that the kid was there. He would brainwash this kid day in and day out. Nobody loves you. Nobody cares about you. You know, I'm the only one that knows how to love you and all this. And just stay here. Just trust me. He finally, he finally became so confident that he ha finally had her at age 18 that he started actually letting her go out of the house. He told his parents, oh, yeah, she's my new girlfriend. Um, she started going about the neighborhood, and there's a little store, a little, you know, convenience store, and she started going there, and this thing went on, though, all the way up to age 24, from 14 to age 24, 10 years. She starts talking to this one guy at this grocery store, his name is Spirico, and he starts befriending her, and he senses something's not right with this young girl, Something, something's broken, something's sad, and he starts probing and she was giving him an entirely different name. And finally she broke down and she said, my name is Tanya Kosh. And she tells this 
horrific story of how this building guard had convinced her that nobody cared for her, nobody loved her, and had taken her for 10 years and tried to make her his own. Well, when Spirico heard it, his son was an ex-cop. Uh, he was retired. He told his son. His son quickly got involved. They got the police involved, and they, they, wake, they woke this girl up that this man had been lying. This man had been brainwashing her. Well, well, here's the tragedy. She had given up hope that her father loved her when she was 14. All those years, this guy would keep reminding her, your parents don't care about you. They're not looking for you. They don't love you. Give up hope. And she had. She had absolutely given up hope that she meant anything to her parents. And the circumstances seemed to affirm that because she didn't see anybody coming to look for her. But in fact, of the matter, her father looked for her relentlessly. He, he knocked, you know, put things up on the telephone poles. He did things in the, the milk cartons. He did everything he could. He never went a day his life, he said, for 10 years and 10 days because it was at that point that she was returned that he didn't think about her that he didn't seek her, that he didn't love her. She was finally restored to her father, and of course it, it, was, it was just magnificent and moving. I mean, she realized that all this time, she had given up hope on her father's love, but her father loved her with all of his heart. All of his heart. And it is critical that you and I never lose that absolute certainty that our God loves us. We can, we can hope in his love no matter what's going on in our life, no matter who says or does what to us, we can hold on to that. And when we do, our hope is not going to be disappointed. And that opens those floodgates to keep our souls saturated with his love. And when our souls are filled with his love, we are better lovers of the people in our lives. Because we are not so needy and demanding, we can love them because our tank is full. We don't have to get a lot from them, but what we do get from them, we cherish and we adore it. And it's beautiful and it's wonderful and our love is healthier. But if we go through life without this, this inflow of God's love for which we are made... Then we're empty and we're vulnerable and our capacities diminish and don't develop. And, and we become beings that are quite vulnerable and also quite demanding. We need to trust in his love. We need to meditate on it because if we don't practice this meditation, if we don't think about this, let, let me tell you, as much as you may feel it for a given time, I know this, I'd leak. Uh, you know, I, I full, get filled up with his love and it just kind of leaks out. I get busy. I'm like a, a pot with a lot of holes in it, you know. And you are too. And unless you practice this, unless I practice this regularly, I don't go through life looking like a Christian, even though I may be one. I go through life looking like a goody two-shoes. I go through life looking like a moralist. You know, I go through life approaching God like a set of do's and don'ts. There's something Something unhealthy, something unholy, something that's not contagious in a lovely way. The beauty of Christ is blunted. I'm just an ugly moralist. And you know what I'm talking about. We all can drift there. But when I'm full of his love, there, there's an intuition. There, there's, a, there, there's a power. There's a beauty. There's a winsomeness. That's what Christianity really, truly is. And nothing less. Nothing less. I want to close with a story that um, ironically comes from NPR, National Public Radio. And um, it's written by a guy named John W. Fountain. National Public Radio does a series, maybe some of you have heard it, it's called This I Believe. Any, any of you ever heard it before on the radio? And it's people that will tell some of their personal stories. And um, it, it's fascinating, actually. But this one guy, John W. Fountain, he's a professor of journalism at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He was formerly a national correspondent for the New York Times. And this is the testimony that he gave on the NPR series, uh, This I Believe. And I'm going to do my best. Okay, here we go. He says, I believe in God, not the cosmic intangible spirit in the sky that Mama told me as a little boy always was and always will be, but the God who embraced me when daddy disappeared from our lives, uh, when he disappeared from my life at age four, the night the police led him down the stairs away from our front door in handcuffs, the God who warmed me when we could see our breath inside the freezing apartment, 
when the gas was disconnected in the dead of another wind-whipped Chicago winter, when there was no food, little hope, and no hot water, the God who held my hand when I witnessed boys in my hood swallowed by the elements, by death, by hopelessness, who claimed me when I felt like no man's son, amidst the absence of any man to wrap his arms around me and tell me everything's going to be okay, a man to speak proudly of me and to call me son. I believe in God, God the Father embodied in His Son, Jesus Christ, the God who allowed me to feel His presence, whether by the warmth that filled my belly like hot chocolate on a cold afternoon, or that voice whenever I found myself in the tempest of life storms telling me, even when I was told I was nothing, that I was something, that I was His. And even amid the desertion of the man who gave me his name and DNA and little else, I might find in him sustenance. I, <laughs> I believe in God, the God who I have come to know as Father, as Abba, as Daddy. It wasn't until many years later, standing over my father's grave for a conversation long overdue, that my tears began to flow. I told him about the man I had become. And about how much I wished he had been in my life. And I realized fully that in his absence, I had found another. Or rather that he, God the Father, God my Father, had found me. That's the kind of love of God that every human soul needs. He felt it. It sustained him, it transformed him, and it is the free gift that God so desperately wants us to take. And he wants us to take it today and tomorrow and next week and next month. And when you least feel you deserve it, he wants you to take it again. He wants you to have that audacity that John the Apostle had that you'll look him in the face and say, I'm the disciple that you love. My father, I know you're fond of me. And when you and I live in that, and it lives in us, Christ can show himself alive in us, and others will see it, and we will be different beings than what we are when we walk around with that component, that spiritual void of that love filling us. And I want to say it again, I don't care how loved you are by people, and God bless you, some of you are wonderfully loved. And I've got I to say for myself, I, I've had more love given to me in my life than one man deserves. Most, most of my love has come through the body of Jesus, and you can, you can always find Jesus' love in his people, in his body, but God has put all kinds of people in my life. I, I, I want to say it again. I have never been cheated. I am more loved than any man deserves to be. But with all that being said, it is not enough without this love of God flooding my soul, and it's not enough for you either. Will you let it in? Will you open the floodgates, and will you make this a lifestyle that's what our loving God is here humbly urging us to do today. Open and open it. Open the floodgate again today, tomorrow. Life is going to get busy. You're going to forget. You're going to get distracted. You're going to have things to get angry over. You're going to have things to get stressed over. You're going to have heartbreak. Open the floodgates for the rest of your life. Make it a matter of practice. And if maybe you're here and this is all a bit confusing and this is the first time you even heard that God loves you personally, Know for a fact that his spirit drew you to be here this day, that you could hear in the most clear possible way that you matter, your life matters so much that Christ, to prove his love for you, died on the cross to pay for your sins. He loved you when you could, couldn't care less about him, and he still loves you. And if you'll put your faith in him, if you'll make a decision to be his follower, he promises you the forgiveness of your sins and everlasting life in his kingdom, a kingdom of everlasting love, the kind you've always wanted. If you haven't made that decision to put your faith in Christ, to say, let the rest of the world do what it will, I'm going to follow Jesus because I trust him. That's the start of opening that floodgate of God's love. I hope before you leave here today, uh, you'll make that decision. Let's pray.
Father, we confess that the truth about us, no matter how learned, no matter how sophisticated, no matter how accomplished, no matter how tough or hard or achieved we may seem to be, all it takes is a little aloneness, a little quiet, the right set of circumstances, and we are scared, orphaned children who long for you, our Father, and your love. Your protecting love, your healing love, your encouraging love. We, we, we live for your approval, and you just want to shower it on us. Help us. Help us to live in this, that your love may live in us, and it may find its way through us. That we'll be more than just do-gooders. We will be your incarnate love, Lord Jesus, to all who know us. Thank you. Thank you for this everlasting certainty of your unfailing love. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.